Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's webinar, which is on applied nutrition for hormone dysfunction. Um, so my name is Kyla Williams, and for any of you who don't know me, I am a nutritional therapist, so I do deal with a lot of clients with hormone type dysfunction. Um, it is, of course, a very common issue. So I'll be talking a lot about some of the practical ways in which you can help your clients in terms of diets, supplements, um, etc. help to balance hormones in the body. So just to summarize what I'm going to be talking about today, firstly, it's of course very important to understand the role of all the different hormones in the body as they interact um, so closely together. So we shouldn't just look at individual hormones on their own. Um, but I'm going to be particular attention to the sex hormones and uh, looking at reproductive health and symptoms such as acne, PMS, infertility, and looking both at male and female hormones. So we often forget about male hormones. Of course, both are very important. The female reproductive system is a little bit more complicated, um, which is why it gets a bit more attention. But I'll be touching on male hormones as well as that is quite important. So there's lots of different factors which can impact hormone levels in the body. So I'll go through some of these um, so you can understand what's going on and why and why certain hormones may be higher or lower than they should be. Such a bit on diagnostic tests. And the majority of this talk is going to be on the nutritional protocol, balancing hormones, um, diet, supplements and lifestyle as well. Can I just check in the chat box? Can everybody hear me OK? Probably should have checked at the beginning. Yep, you can all hear me fine. That's good. Brilliant. Right, I'll carry on. So, the endocrine system. Of course, it's an absolutely huge system with lots of glands producing many, many hormones in their body. They all work together. Um, and this is a huge list of all of them. I'm not going to talk them today in detail, of course, as that would take a very, very long time. I'm going to be concentrating on any of the hormones here in blue. So, the luteinizing hormone follicle stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland, um, or the testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. So any that are very important for reproductive health and that will determine symptoms that are often associated with hormone imbalances, although when someone said their hormones are imbalanced, it could be any of these and many, many more. Um, this is just to give an idea of, of how much is out there. And even the GI tract, people often forget about that being um, very, very influential on, on the... Um, hormones produced in the body as well. So in terms of the roles of hormones in the body, just general role of lots of different hormones um, that can impact the metabolism, cardiovascular health, immune function, brain function, mood, um, even ability to sleep, for example, bone density, um, of course, appetite control, GI, GI tract releasing leptin, ghrelin, uh, and then there's a reproductive health. So that's the part that we're very, very interested in today. Um, and then I'm going to talk a lot more about, um, as it's a very, very complex area, but very important to be able to understand um, for our clients that have lots of symptoms. So for the sex hormones, what can go wrong? Well, quite a lot can go wrong, really. There's lots and lots of different things um, associated with hormone imbalances. So, first of all, the obvious is infertility. If you have a client come to see you and they're finding it very, very difficult to get pregnant, they're probably going to start questioning their hormones and may ask for some tests and ask and, um, for what they can do. Then there's lots of conditions as well linked to hormone imbalances. There's fibroids, endometriosis, polycystic ovary syndrome, ovarian cysts as well. So I'll touch on these a little bit just so that you're able to understand the symptoms associated with them so you may know when to refer clients on to, to see their GP so you can either identify or exclude some of these conditions. And then there's lots of other symptoms of PMS, mood fluctuations, um, neurotransmitter production could be low, so this could lead to depression, difficulty sleeping, um, there's period pains, there's skin issues like acne. Um, then for men, there's hair loss. Um, so early balding for women, excess hair growth. So on the face and the arms, especially, there could be too much hair growth. Um, reduced muscle mass. So this is more common in men as they age and also reduced libido as well. So all these kind of areas I'm going to look at um, and discuss how you can identify certain symptoms and then 
the nutrition protocol for that particular area. So let's start with endometriosis. Now this is an inflammatory condition whereby the womb lining tissue is growing outside of the womb. So it's exactly the same type of tissue, um, often on the ovaries, the lining of the pelvis, behind the uterus and at the top of the vagina. So in an ideal situation, you wouldn't have this, you'd have the womb lining tissue only inside the womb. However, this causes symptoms of painful and very heavy periods. And that's that, quite, that is quite a common complaint by a lot of women. Um, this is something to consider at least. Um, and it, again, just general pain in the lower abdomen area, they may complain about that as well. So basically the tissue acts exactly the same as it would inside the womb. It will thicken throughout the month and it will shed every month as well. And this causes pain as the tissue at the blood has nowhere to go. Um, so it causes lots of inflammation, lots of swelling, and of course can cause fertility problems if your own ovaries or fallopian tubes are damaged in any way. So something to consider, endometriosis, if someone's presenting symptoms of painful heavy periods in particular. So next is polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. Now, polycystic ovary syndrome is a combination of a few different symptoms um, and levels of hormones. So in order for this to be diagnosed, sorry, someone's saying the sound has gone. Is anyone else having this problem or can you hear me? No, you can hear? Okay, it must just be a problem with your computer perhaps. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, good idea. Log out, log in, that always works. <laughs> okay, so polycystic ovary syndrome. Usually this is diagnosed by a GP if someone has two or three of certain symptoms. So the first one being cysts. So if someone has lots of undeveloped sacs um, in the ovaries containing fluids, uh, basically undeveloped eggs, um, this is one of the main symptoms really of polycystic ovary syndrome. If someone has a lot of cysts and they also have high testosterone levels or one of the symptoms below, um, particularly excess weight gain or excess hair growth, then they usually get diagnosed with polycystic ovary syndrome. So basically what's happening in this is the ovaries are not releasing eggs. Ovulation is not happening. Um, for some people, it may happen occasionally. It could be every few months, even every six months. Uh, in severe cases, someone may not have a period at all. So basically, the problem is infertility due to the fact that ovulation isn't actually occurring. And high testosterone um, is one of the contributing factors to that. But the fact that the, the, the cysts are undeveloped um, and the eggs aren't properly developing is, is the main problem causing this. So symptoms, you have irregular periods if ovulation isn't happening um, or no periods at all. Difficulty getting pregnant. So because no ovulation, someone may be trying for several years and it could be the reason that they're not actually ovulating. Um, the excess hair growth on the face, the chest, the back and even the arms. This is usually due to the high level of testosterone. Um, weight gain is usually associated with PCOS due to difficulties um, with insulin sensitivity, so not very sensitive to insulin, um, high insulin levels, um, and difficulties with dealing with carbohydrates. Another symptom is thinning hair as well. So for someone who has any of these symptoms or if they've been diagnosed, most people will usually know they have it if they're coming to see you, if they've really been to their GP at least. Um, but you do need to consider risk of type 2 diabetes and high insulin levels um, and possibly in terms of dietary factors looking at refined carbohydrates as well. So the next is ovarian cysts. So I've talked a little bit about cysts in polycystic ovary syndrome, but ovarian cysts can occur even if someone doesn't have the hormone, the high testosterone um, to go with it. So someone can have cysts on their own without PCOS. So basically if a follicle doesn't release the egg or if it doesn't release the discharge um, of the fluid as it normally would, it can basically swell and becomes a cyst. Um, and these can collect within the ovaries and you can get quite a collection of, of cysts occurring. Generally speaking, they're fairly harmless. Um, they rarely cause any pain unless they're quite large. So if they do quite, grow quite big, they can cause a depression and that can cause pain. Um, but generally they go with time. Um, sometimes they won't, but most of the time they generally come and go 
um, especially different times in the month, they can get larger, smaller, but usually it's from the egg not being released. Sometimes it can be the eggs released and the remaining tissue, so that's the corpus luteum, so this um, tissue down here, as you can see. So after the eggs been released, you have the remaining tissue, and that sometimes can also fill with fluid and become a cyst as well. Generally, not too much of a problem, though. Um, some types of cysts, the pathological cysts, Basically, it's an abnormal cell growth. So this is not really related to hormone levels. So normal cysts would fluctuate, get larger and smaller throughout the month. Um, these abnormal pathological cysts, they just generally grow and they quite get quite big. Um, and they are the type that will cause problems that like block blood supply to the ovaries. They can even burst if they get very, very large, which of course can be extremely painful. And usually these are treated... Um, with surgery so they can be surgically removed if they're causing a problem but otherwise it's very recommended just to to leave them alone and let them um, disappear on their own the next one is fibroids so again another non-cancerous -can tumor um, usually in or around the womb this can result in heavy periods again painful periods abdominal pain even back pain constipation if it's blocking um, certain areas and painful intercourse as well so a lot of these conditions that i've spoken about including the cyst that can also cause some of the pain um painful periods as well yeah they can all they all link to infertility um so just especially important to be aware that, that they could um be a case for your clients and fibroids is associated with estrogen levels. So generally at times when women have higher estrogen levels, they're more likely to have fibroids. It's not really clear on the cause of them and what actually causes them, but generally too much estrogen increases risk of, of fibroids. And it's most common in overweight women as well. So let's get into the actual hormones, the female hormones, what they do, when they're produced and how it all works. Um, so we have the hypothalamus in the brain, which um, then sends signals to the pituitary gland and to the ovaries, which controls the female hormone production. So most importantly, we have estrogen and progesterone. There's lots, lots of different types of estrogen. I'll be talking about estrogen just generally, which includes um, all of these. It's just much simpler to discuss this this way. Um, follicle stimulating hormone. Um, we're discussing how this produces um, the estrogen or how it, it stimulates the ovaries to produce the estrogen, luteinizing hormone as well um, to stimulate progesterone production. And then, of course, there's testosterone. It's always considered a male hormone, but women do produce testosterone and some women produce too much. So it's important to look at testosterone levels. Uh, and then we've got melatonin. So melatonin, of course, is going to regulate sleep. So for any kind of hormones, you want to have the best sleep quality as possible so i always think it's an important one to consider melatonin levels so this is just a nice little diagram to show how the different glands are secreting hormones and how the ovaries are stimulated um, to produce the important hormones estrogen and progesterone so we have the hypothalamus in the brain um, this is producing the gonadotropin hormone releasing hormone and this stimulates the pituitary gland to produce the follicle stimulating hormone here. So this is the first half of the month. So the follicular phase, this is when you're producing the most FSH and this is gonna stimulate, stimulate the ovaries to produce estrogen. The second half of the month for the menstrual cycle, this is when the pituitary gland releases um, luteinizing hormone. So this then stimulates the ovaries to produce progesterone. So I hope that makes sense. It's, it is quite confusing when it comes to female health, but it's important to understand what's going on so that when your clients do have a certain high level of one type of hormone, you can figure out exactly what's going on and, and what needs to be produced more of or less of in the body. So here's the very well known, very well um, used diagram with lots of waves of all the different hormones going up and down. Uh, yes, it does look very confusing and often practitioners will be able to recognize this diagram but not exactly remember by heart which hormone is being produced when um, but if you can understand this it really really does help in terms of being able to identify hormone imbalances in the body so if we start actually at the end of the cycle all the hormones are very very low so here you want the hormones to be as low as possible and this is because the hypothalamus will register these low levels of hormones 
and it will stimulate the pituitary gland to produce FSH. So the FSH, this, so this green, green line here, um, a slight rise in the FSH. Someone's saying that the sound is coming and going. Is there a problem with my connection? Or is it yours? If everyone else can hear me fine, yes, it must be your connection. As long as some, most of you can hear me at the moment, that's a good thing. Right, okay, I'll carry on. So I was saying at the beginning of the menstrual cycle, you want to have the FSH to be released, and this then stimulates the body to... Um, it's, it's stimulating the follicles to grow, basically. So FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, stimulates these follicles. They get larger and larger. And as they get bigger, they produce more and more estrogen. So that's why you see this red area. The estrogen level rises in the body. When estrogen is high, this then stimulates the body to release luteinizing hormone. Now, luteinizing hormone is only stimulated when the estrogen level is high enough. And luteinizing hormone will then encourage ovulation so we need all these steps we need the fsh production to produce enough estrogen from the developed follicles and this then will encourage ovulation with the luteinizing hormone once ovulation has occurred the corpus luteum so this arrow here so the excess waste basically from when the egg has been released this will produce progesterone so after ovulation progesterone levels increase and that's exactly what we want. If pregnancy doesn't happen um, just after ovulation, then progesterone levels will gradually decline. And then we have the nice low levels of hormones at the end of the cycle. And in terms of body temperature, if someone's trying to figure out their time of ovulation, it usually peaks just as you ovulate. So, or even just after sometimes. So ideally, if someone's um, measuring their temperature changes, they don't want to do it at the same time every day, so first thing from waking, and then it's a good way of seeing when you're actually ovulating. So if someone um, is trying to become pregnant, that's a, a good, very, very easy way to understand at which point they're ovulating. So in terms of what can go wrong when the, the hormones are imbalanced, usually, very, very commonly, it's due to the fact that hormones are not cleared from the body at the end of the menstrual cycle. So if you imagine at the end of the cycle, the hormones are really, very really high. The body is not going to particularly want to be producing more FSH. The, the way FSH is stimulated that it's produced is due to low levels of hormones. So if you haven't cleared these hormones out, FSH isn't going to be produced at a particularly high level. So if the pituitary gland is not stimulated enough to produce high levels of FSH, this results in the follicles not developing properly then estrogen production from the follicles is going to be quite low. So it's a real knock-on effect, low FSH, low estrogen levels. Um, and then as a result, the estrogen peak is not going to be particularly high. So you're going to get low luteinizing hormone. Now, if it's very, very low production of luteinizing hormone, that could result in ovulation not occurring. Um, it can basically reduce fertility, if that's the case. Uh, and as a result of that, there's going to be low progesterone. So in terms of knock-on effects and not being able to clear hormones from the body properly, it really can cause low production of all the hormones um, throughout. There's lots, lots more that can go wrong, but this is just something that's, that's quite common that can happen in the body. So progesterone deficiency, probably one of the most common issues you'll see in terms of women that have PMS type symptoms, um, so other symptoms being insomnia, painful breath, unexplained weight gain, anxiety, headaches, and of course infertility. These are all associated with low levels of progesterone, and this is most common because of the the difficulties with clearing out hormones in the body, um, and then FSH production being low, and, and and so on. So as a result, that can result in progesterone deficiency. So, of course, you can test for all of these, but I'm just going to go through the symptoms firstly. So if anyone is unwilling to do a test or can't afford it, for example, then there are ways that you can try to identify what may be going on in their body in terms of hormones. So for anyone with low progesterone, it's firstly very important to consider the liver. 
So if they're not clear, clearing hormones in their body at the end of the cycle, then liver function is very, very important. It's very common for people that are drinking lots, not particularly eating well, um, to have a struggling liver and then as a result of low progesterone. Another one is stress levels as well. So stress hormones can have a huge impact. Um, cortisol levels can actually reduce progesterone, so it can have a direct impact on progesterone levels if someone's quite stressed. And then there's fibre intake. So a lot of the hormone issues is going to be the same thing. It'd be liver, stress, fibre, digestion in general, to help clear out some of the hormones. If someone has a very, very low fibre diet, if they're constipated a lot of the time, it's quite likely they're going to reabsorb hormones as well. But generally speaking, fibre intake for um, just general general health um, to make sure they're getting the hormones out at the end of the cycle so they get the high FSH reduction. So estrogen deficiency is another problem that can occur and this is most common in menopausal women. So I say aged 45 plus, it can happen at quite a different range of ages. It could be anywhere from 45 to 60. The average age I think is around, I think it's 52, but it's around between 50, 54 is um, most common age when most women will start going through menopause but it does vary a lot so if, if one of your clients is over 45 you may want to consider menopause if they have any of these flushes um like the the hot flushes um night sweats vaginal dryness um also painful intercourse even memory problems and if they feel quite lethargic as well so they're quite different to the other kind of pms type symptoms um but anyone with these kind of symptoms straight away think about estrogen deficiency Again, liver support, one of the most important things um, in terms of regulating the hormones. You can consider estrogenic foods. Um, I mean, there's a lot of research that has gone into estrogenic foods, very, very different results, some uh, explaining that there, there is benefit, others not so much. I'll talk on that a little bit um, later on as well. Um, and then there's estrogenic herbs like black cohosh. Um, again, research very mixed. A lot of um, a lot of a lot of good results, um, but in terms of the large trials, there's just not enough research out there. Um, but it's something worth trying uh, if someone's quite desperate and they don't want to go on HRT. So the next problem that can cause is estrogen dominance. So this is most common just before menopause, so around age forty to fifty, and this is when there's not enough progesterone in balance with estrogen. So you can still have quite low estrogen, medium levels of estrogen, um, but very, very low progesterone. So it's the ratio between the two. So it just means estrogen is higher. So whether they're both low, both medium, um, estrogen is higher. And the symptoms, some of them are going to be the same as the low progesterone symptoms, so the PMS, insomnia, painful breaths, etc. But then there's a few others as well. So high estrogen can often cause bloating, weight gain. Heavy bleeding as well is um, a big one. And we've got migraines, anxiety, mood swings, tender breaths again. Um, so all of these linked to the higher estrogen levels. So considering HRT, if a client is on HRT, sometimes it can be that the dose they're on is too high. So their symptoms can go the other way. They can have low estrogen, go on HRT, and then they can have the opposite problem. And so something's better if they, they are already on HRT. Again, liver detoxification, fibre intake, both very, very important for balancing out these hormones as well. So excess testosterone. Not always the case in women, it's a little bit more rare than the other um, hormone imbalances, but it does of course happen. And it's very, very easy to see in terms of the symptoms that present themselves. So acne is a very, very common one. If a woman has high testosterone, they're much, much more likely to have acne. Um, excess hair growth as well. So it may not be obvious to you seeing a client. They may remove the hair, may have wax the hair. Um, so it's a good thing to ask your clients if they usually, if they feel that they have excess hair growth. And this could be, yeah, mostly on the, the face and arms, really. Um, high testosterone would usually correlate with a high sex drive as well. Um, most common in PCOS, of course, someone's going to have quite high testosterone, thinning hair on the head, ovarian cysts as well. And most people won't know that they have ovarian cysts, but if they have any symptoms, it's worth um, thinking about. Unstable blood sugar levels, so high testosterone, PCOS, unstable blood sugar levels, 
all often work together. They, you see them very, very frequently all together. So that often goes with high testosterone as well. Another result, infertility. So high testosterone does significantly reduce fertility. So again, things to consider, fiber, fiber intake to clear out the excess testosterone. So if someone's, <coughs> sorry. so if someone's constipated a lot, they're much more likely to be absorbing the testosterone back into their body. So if someone does have high levels, it's very, very important to make sure they're having lots of fiber, ideally a couple of bowel movements a day, just to make sure they're getting out as much as possible. Also, alcohol intake, it can impact testosterone levels. Um, I've referenced the study in another slide later on in terms of testosterone in men. Um, but of course, it's going to be slightly different on women as it can reduce testosterone in men. Um, it has also shown to increase testosterone in some groups of people and in women. So it's just something that can increase or reduce testosterone. And again, stress levels. If someone is chronically stressed, if they have chronic fatigue, um, this, if they have very low DHEA levels, for example, that can um, impact testosterone. So high levels or low levels of DHEA can either increase or reduce testosterone. So male hormones. Men will often not complain so much about their hormone levels. It's something that they often don't come to practitioners quite as much about until they start worrying about their muscle, um, mass, and particularly when they're aging, if they have hair loss as well. So in terms of male hormones, we usually concentrate on testosterone, um, so release from the testes. There's also the adrenal hormones, so DHEA and cortisol, importantly, play a massive role in testosterone levels in men, um, so something to always consider. Melatonin again, so sleep, the sleep hormone. Sleep quality is going to have a massive impact on the stress hormones which will then impact testosterone as well. So estrogen, although uh, considered a female hormone, does occur in men in small amounts. So you do get a small production in the liver and the adrenal glands as well. And there's lots of chemicals which can also increase estrogen or mimic estrogen in the body, which can cause problems for men. So testosterone deficiency in men is most common over the age of 50. So as men age, their testosterone naturally declines um, and the symptoms that result are usually muscle loss, slightly enlarged breast tissue, a lower sex drive, fatigue and also erectile dysfunction as well. So all these kind of symptoms that men really, really do not want at all. Um, they often don't necessarily understand the link between the hormone changes and some of these um, symptoms. But if you do have any men that come to see you and they are bothered about these kind of things, it's good to kind of explain to them what's going on and explain about testosterone levels declining as we age. So things to consider for men, increasing muscle building exercise has a massive impact on testosterone levels. So weight training can increase testosterone. Uh, next is zinc as well. So the production of testosterone requires quite a lot of zinc. So if someone has a deficiency in zinc, this is something to think about. And then adrenal function. So in terms of DHEA levels and cortisol, that's going to have a huge impact on testosterone. Um, so make sure the adrenals are working well to make sure that testosterone production is healthy. So the excess estrogen, probably not what a man would want to hear, um, but it does happen and it can cause early hair loss. So if a, if a man is balding quite early, it could be due to high Estrogen, so it's the ratio between estrogen and um, testosterone. So testosterone is a little bit low, estrogen is a little bit high, can cause hair loss. Other symptoms like irritability, again, breast enlargement, um, weight gain, especially around the thighs, hips and buttocks. So the kind of areas where most women would store fat, if that is occurring in men, definitely consider their estrogen levels. So consider their balance between testosterone, estrogen, Consider liver detoxification, digestion as well. So very, very important for anything that's in excess. So if you have excess estrogen, you want to make sure the body's flushing it out as much as possible. So it's putting the liver and digestion are really, really going to help um, with that. High estrogen in men has also shown to increase risk of prostate cancer. So it's really, really not an ideal situation um, for a man to be in. So here's just the main points in terms of male hormones. There's so much to talk about about female hormones. 
but in terms of male hormones here's here's the basics and what to what to concentrate on so we have adrenal function um methods to manage stress of course um if, if someone's working very hard and they're very very stressed it's going to impact their hormones so the first things first manage their stress levels um, reduce alcohol easier said than done but it's going to have a huge impact on testosterone um, weight loss well so if someone does does have a high bmi or high fat percentage weight loss has actually shown um, to increase testosterone levels and particularly weight training so if someone's overweight they have low testosterone a low sex drive for example weight training is going to help bump up their levels um, and may help to improve some of their symptoms as well and of course muscle mass um, so refined foods of course that's going to help with insulin um, sensitivity and of course that's very important in terms of just general stress levels and other hormones in the body so that's something to consider liver function which i've already spoken about and also i said bpa here and other chemicals so there's a lot of estrogenic mimicking chemicals but bpa is very very important there's so much research on bpa um so chemical used in a lot of plastics and that can have quite a negative impact on male hormones. So in terms of treatment options for hormone imbalances, most people, or most women at least, will be put on the contraceptive pill if they ever go to their GP and complain of any kind of symptoms linking to PMS, um, acne, for example. Easiest thing is just to put someone on a contraceptive pill and their symptoms generally go away. So it's not exactly addressing the root cause of the problem but it will help to relieve symptoms now of course many clients that we may see um wouldn't want to take contraceptive pill so they may be looking for the natural approach if someone's looking for the natural approach um that's great a lot of people may have been on the contraceptive pill in the past there's two main types you either have the estrogen plus progesterone pill or you can have progesterone only so it really depends on the person in terms of their symptoms and which pill they may be put on. However, there are quite a few side effects, um, so digest, digestive complaints, um, even difficulties absorbing certain vitamins and minerals, low sex drive and weight gain. So they're probably the most three common in terms of complaints of women on the pill, um, which you may hear, but at least they help to get rid of their symptoms, um, but it's not exactly helping the actual cause. And then for women who are a little bit older, if they're going through menopause, um, they may be put on hormone replacement therapy, which is very, very similar thing to the contraceptive pill. Um, they're given synthetic hormones, estrogen plus progesterone for most people. Uh, if someone's had a hysterectomy, they're going to have the ovaries um, or the womb, so they can go on an estrogen only um, replacement therapy. Now for men, if their testosterone levels are very, very low, they may go on testosterone replacement therapy as well. So it's good to know what's out there and, and what people are taking and why. So here's just the main symptoms. I've listed the symptoms next to what they may um, mean in terms of hormone levels. And I've just put in bold some of the very, very common um, symptoms to consider. So acne, excess hair growth, of course, that's going to link to testosterone, PCOS, um, blood sugar imbalances, excess weight around the hips, thigh and buttocks area, generally going to be an estrogen dominance, and that's men and women as well. So it could be a woman that has um, a particularly large amount of fat that's stored around the hips, for example. Um, it's one thing if it, you know, genetically someone's slightly more pear-shaped, um, but if someone has quite a lot of fat in one particular area, it could be estrogen dominance. Now, all the kind of PMS, anxiety, painful breasts, um, all those symptoms are generally progesterone deficiency, most commonly. In terms of heavy bleeding, anxiety, um, mood swings, most often estrogen dominance. So it could still be low, low progesterone, but slightly higher estrogen. And something for so this is to consider stress levels. Um, as it's often involved quite closely. So insomnia, if someone's complaining about insomnia, important to consider melatonin levels, consider their cortisol levels. If someone's very stressed, if the cortisol is very high, it's going to be very difficult for them to sleep. And also progesterone deficiency, which is associated with insomnia. So consider this as well. In terms of heavy and painful periods, this could be lots of inflammation in the body. There could, they could have endometriosis, cysts, 
um, or any other kind of conditions linked to the painful periods. Also, painful intercourse. A lot of those conditions um, are linked to painful in intercourse as well, so endometriosis, fibroids, cysts, um, and generally speaking, more common with an estrogen deficiency uh, and inflammation in women. Now, the night sweats, hot flushes, very, very obviously, um, the menopause, uh, estrogen deficiency, so for the older women, definitely consider that. Lack of energy, so for men, lack of energy, reduced libido, erectile dysfunction and memory problems, always consider testosterone deficiency. It's most common is testosterone deficiency if they're a little bit older and they're getting any of these kind of symptoms. Um, much more simple, it's one of the two, it's testosterone deficiency or it's excess estrogen, generally speaking. Uh, so in terms of hair loss, uh, breast tissue enlargement and muscle loss, more likely to be excess estrogen, um, but as well as a little bit of testosterone deficiency as well. So <clears throat> once you've identified possible hormone imbalances, depending on the symptoms, it's quite useful to be able to carry out a diagnostic test. Now, of course, not everyone's going to want to do a diagnostic test. So if you just go on the symptoms and you feel fairly confident that you know what's going on and you've asked lots and lots of questions, absolutely fine. But if you really want to get on paper, understand what's going on, show your clients that you have numbers to work with at the starting point, it's always quite useful, especially for motivation as well, in terms of changing those numbers and getting things in, in the ideal ranges. So in terms of diagnostic tests for hormones, we have urine hormone testing, um, which basically measures hormone metabolites, which... Uh, generally not used so much in terms of um, hormone diagnostic analysis. We have blood testing. So this is measuring the free and the bound hormones um, in the blood. And this is a single blood draw, which gives you the levels of hormones for one, um, one time, basically. So this is generally fine for men if their hormones aren't fluctuating too much. They do still fluctuate quite a little bit. But generally speaking, they're not having massive fluctuations throughout the month. Um, for women, I'd always recommend saliva testing. This measures the free hormones. So by free and bound, this basically means the free hormones are the hormones that are used in the cells, in the body, so they're active, actively being used. And the bound hormones are bound to proteins, so they're not being used at that time. So we want to really understand about the free hormones, especially for women. Um, and ideally, it's useful to know the different <laughs> the different amounts throughout the day, throughout the month, so different times throughout the month as well. Um, so very, very useful to do a saliva testing, diagnostic test for women. And the test generally will do it, use saliva samples four different times throughout the day. So all the different factors that impact sex hormones. We have liver function, of course. Um, Chemical and heavy metal toxicity. So the chemicals being lots of the kind of BPA type chemicals. Um, heavy metals can be found in fish, for example, and alcohol intakes. All of these are going to impact liver function, how well the body is producing hormones and um, getting rid of them from the body as well. And then we have digestive function. So digestive function is mostly important due to the fact that, of course, it's playing a big role in the endocrine function by releasing lots of hormones, but also in terms of taking hormones out of the body. So with particular attention to fiber, um, digestive function um, should it be optimized. Uh, another impacting um, factor is blood sugar imbalance. So blood sugar imbalance can have a huge impact on stress levels um, and a knock-on effect for other types of hormones in the body as well, if some, especially if someone has PCOS, for example. Uh, another thing is inflammation. So if someone has an imbalanced arachidonic acid to EPA ratio, this could be causing more inflammation in the body. If someone has period pains, this could be exacerbating it. Um, any kind of inflammatory condition or any condition linked to pain, painful periods, for example, um, painful intercourse, any kind of inflammation is going to make the, um, the problem much, much worse. Uh, also nutritional status so any kind of deficiencies for example zinc is going to impact the production of testosterone so any nutritional status should be considered just to make sure someone's all round fairly healthy um, exercise bmi that's going to have a huge impact on 
hormone levels in the body if someone's exercising generally they're going to be regulating the hormones a little bit better if their bmi is quite high especially for men that could reduce their testosterone um, so one to watch out for so stress we've spoken about that already a little bit um, but ensuring that the adrenals are functioning quite well is always important um, and then lastly sleep quality so getting the melatonin levels um, healthy so chemicals to avoid in products and the environment this is po possibly one of the most researched areas in terms of balancing hormones is to do with all the different chemicals out there which either block or mimic hormones um, the general members of the public may not be too aware of it but the amount of hormones we use is huge and the amount of xenoestrogens so these chemicals which um, act as hormones are everywhere um, there's even been reduced fish po po um, populations um, in areas where E2, so that's a type of estrogen, has been quite high. So it can affect, has shown to affect fertility in fish quite a bit and even um, sex changes as well has occurred in fish. Um, of course, this is not transferred to humans as such, but it does have a massive, massive impact in terms of uh, hormone levels, hormone imbalances. So some of the other chemicals to consider are parabens. So these are found mostly in cosmetics. So shampoos, conditioners, um, those kind of things. We have phthalates as well. So these are chemicals often used to carry fragrances. They're in a lot of perfumes, air fresheners. Um, so they get into the air quite a bit as well. And then one of the important ones, BPA. So the chemical used in a lot of plastics. Um, and it really, really disrupts the menstrual cycle um, for both men and women and this can cause estrogen dominance for women and excess estrogen for men as well so all these chemicals generally are going to cause a huge amount of problems so in terms of products to change uh, cleaning products so a lot of cleaning products will have these chemicals in um, even washing powders there's a lot of skincare products, so sun cream, makeups, moisturizers that have huge amounts of chemicals in, especially with sun cream. Um, a lot of mums are quite worried about their children having too much sun exposure. And we all know they're often becoming vitamin D deficient as well, which isn't particularly ideal. Um, but again, sun cream has a lot of chemicals, which is absorbed through the skin, of course. Uh, then there's toys as well. A lot of kids toys are full of plastic with all these chemicals in um, and they often put them in their mouth. So it's really not ideal. Uh, ideally, you can buy BPA-free products, um, so toys for children, wooden toys as well. And in terms of food containers, there's a lot of, if anyone's having ready meals and sticking it in the microwave, that of course is going to be leaching a lot of the, the chemicals into the food. Um, so ideally, you don't want to be heating any of these plastics. There's a certain amount that may get into the food when you're just covering food with plastic or storing it in plastic. But when it's actually heated, um, there's a lot more chemicals that are released. So I would say for anyone, even buying food in plastic, um, transfer it to a metal, uh, metal or plastic, um, sorry, metal or glass container, but for microwave, of course, using glass containers is the best thing to do in terms of reducing the amount of these chemicals. And even cooking utensils, you don't particularly want to be using plastic cooking utensils. Um, so stainless steel um, or wood, ideally for that. So definitely try to help people as the number one, literally the number one um, a piece of advice I would give for hormone balancing to any of your clients is to cut out all these chemicals. So basically go natural in terms of all these chemicals. If they look in their cupboards, it's, it, you know, there's so, so many different products, um, even considered nail varnish, uh, paints you use in the house, all of these are going to contain lots and lots of chemicals. So get rid of as many of these as possible, give the liver a break. You're not having the high estrogenic um, mimicking hormones being produced and it's going to help you clear the hormones at the end of the menstrual cycle and reduce the amount of estrogen for men which they really do not want. Um, so these kind of chemicals are also present in food, so in, in pesticides for example, so if someone's not eating organic, the majority of people aren't, um, then this can reduce testosterone in men. Um, 
And this can also increase estrogen in women. So it can cause estrogen dominance or reduce testosterone. So exactly what we don't want. Um, so generally speaking, I would say if someone can go organic or at least some of their, some of their food, um, so as much as possible. There's lots of other artificial food ingredients, such as aspartum, which will contain these anyway, estrogens. Uh, again, not particularly good to have. So I would say avoid artificial sweeteners where possible. Um, and then there's lots of heavy metals like mercury, arsenic, lead, cadmium, and these have been associated with reduced sperm count. So for men, that's especially something to look out for. And of course, if a woman's trying to become pregnant, they don't want to have any of these kind of heavy metals at high levels in their body. So especially for mercury, um, good ones to double check that someone's not having huge amounts of tuna, for example, or larger fish, um, something that's quite common with men if they're testosterone levels low and they're trying to build their muscle they may start eating huge amounts of high protein foods lots of fish and if that's the case you might want to double check um just to consider their mercury levels so then we have soy products so the non-fermented soy the very um processed soy products are certainly not ideal for anyone with estrogen dominance uh, as these may mimic the activity of estrogen and in terms of how strong this activity is very very mixed in terms of the research that's been done some studies um, have concluded it's quite strong activities others say it's very very subtle or hardly anything at all so it's generally fine if someone has if you know someone has low estrogen absolutely fine to have soy products i would say in the natural form ideally uh, fermented soy absolutely brilliant so if they're having tempeh for example that would be brilliant um but yeah if someone has estrogen dominance then ideally stick stay away from the soy foods it may not be having a problem but um to be safe i would say perhaps don't consider those foods uh, in countries such as japan for example they, where they have soy throughout their whole lives they generally don't have much of a problem it's usually when people start having synthetic um or overly processed soy um suddenly at one point in their life usually that's when it causes some problems uh, then there's gluten to consider so this can exacerbate problems with gut health so if someone has permeable gut lining if so basically a leaky gut um excess gluten especially if they're sensitive could aggravate and cause some other problems and leaky gut again can increase the reabsorption of hormones so if someone has digestive problems they're much more likely to be reabsorbing these hormones um, back into the body which is um which is not good if someone has high testosterone levels, for example, high estrogen levels. Um, you definitely want to make sure their digestive health is as good as possible. Uh, and then there's water. Of course, water has lots and lots of chemicals in, um, particularly fluoride, which is something to consider. And most of the studies on chemicals in water, at least fluoride, have been on animals, which, of course, is, is not a, ideal. Um, but it has shown reduced fertility in rats. It's very difficult. In humans um, to see just one compounding factor and whether it's going to be making a difference but at least in rats it's very controlled and you can see that it does reduce their fertility quite a bit when exposed to fluoride so in terms of what's in our water it's something that always gets the headlines when people are talking about hormone levels in water and you know the pill people taking the pill causing levels in drinking water to be high and that explaining high estrogen levels for men it's not quite the case um, this is an interesting study that looked at the actual uh, contributing um, factors for estrogen found in water and it was a very 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 tiny amount um, from synthetic estrogen so this is the ee2 found in the pill so of course anyone on the pill or not on the pill they're going to be eating hormones in their urine um but it's a very very small amount compared to all the other different estrogenic uh compounds out there so lots of waste from industries um livestock so they're going to obviously producing lots of estrogen as well um agriculture from pesticides even landfills as well so all these kind of things are going to be impacting increasing the amount of synthetic estrogen in the water um, so of course drinking water is not going to have high levels of synthetic estrogen just from people taking the pill it's going to be mostly from chemicals um, which have been used for treating plastics for example um, and pesticides they're the main sources usually so if you know if a client does ask and that's why they question if they have high estrogen 
it's not exactly this reason it's lots of other but yeah pesticides and plastics i would say the ones to to concentrate on so alcohol consumption of course as the liver plays a huge role in the regulation of hormones we don't really want to be adding in too much additional stresses for the liver so in terms of alcohol consumption we don't want to be having that much excess if someone's having issues with their liver health and hormone balances even if it's for a few months when someone's trying to kick start the balancing process of the hormones it's good to reduce alcohol at least initially um, so alcohol has actually been shown to decrease testosterone in men so it's very difficult to convince a guy to reduce their alcohol consumption but if you explain um someone's just writing a question <laughs> you're depressed about it being in your beer okay so basically yes if you're trying to help a guy to, to increase their testosterone it's good to explain that alcohol does decrease it so ideally they don't want to have too much if they have any of the kind of issues um, associated with low testosterone it also reduces sperm quality so if someone is trying to um, to become pregnant if a couple trying to become pregnant it's something to consider maybe reducing alcohol consumption um, for a certain period of time at least and it's also going to worsen symptoms related to insulin resistance so if someone has PCOS um, they're really not going to deal very well with refined carbohydrates or alcohol at all and of course alcohol is going to reduce the quality of sleep even if someone's sleeping 10 hours after having lots of drinks it's not going to be good quality sleep so it's not as good for in terms of balancing the hormones so i'd say for anyone who's worried about the hormone balancing um i would say try to keep it to three to four units maximum per day alcohol so three for women four for men um but ideally not every day it's good to have rest days at least every other day so if someone has a habit of going out every single night to the pub that's not going to help their liver functions so if someone really can't abstain from the drinking i would say at least have every other day off just to give your liver a bit of a break so it's very forgiving so liver function liver support um everyone always thinks of a detox bit so everyone always plans on eating drinking plenty in december and then doing a detox in january and then they just assume they're absolutely fine for the rest of the year of course it's not quite this simple we need constant supply of lots of antioxidants to support the liver um lots of cruciferous vegetables um like broccoli cabbage Brussels sprouts to support the liver function uh, fiber of course to clear the hormones um ensuring protein is not too high that's another additional additional stress on the liver if someone's having a very very high intake of protein um not not ideal if, if someone's trying to give their liver, liver a break you don't want to have protein intake too low as well i mean one gram per kilogram is an absolute amount to have even up to 1.2 1.5 if someone's doing a lot of exercise but any higher than 1.5 grams per kilogram is generally a little bit of additional stress for the liver to deal with um, so remember that a liver support does not have to be a strict detox diet it's a long-term healthy plan for someone to increase the amount of antioxidants increase the amount of fiber and just ensure that their liver has a break so cutting out some of the chemicals uh, reducing alcohol every now and then and just making sure that it can deal with everything on a day-to-day -day basis there are also a few herbal supplements out there like milk thistles so if someone really wants to boost their detoxification they could always add in some um, herbal supplements as well so digestive health i've mentioned fiber quite a lot but of course we need this to excrete the excess hormones especially soluble fiber so soluble fiber helps to take a lot of hormones out of the body even cholesterol um, it really does help to regulate everything quite well so if someone is on a very very low carbohydrate diet for example they're probably quite having quite a low intake of fiber unless they're having a huge amount of vegetables and lots of greens um but soluble fiber has shown to reduce risk of breast cancer and this is usually because um it's reducing the amount of estrogen or at least regulating it so you don't really get too much estrogen generally um if someone's having lots of soluble fiber so for anyone with estrogen dominance definitely concentrate on digestive health um, in terms of regulating good bacteria in the gut as well it's always nice to have kefir for example other fermented foods to get those good um, levels of bacteria up 
prebiotic foods, so to feed the probiotics, chicory, artichoke, asparagus, banana, always good to have those foods regularly in the diet. Um, not many people like chicory too much, but it's extremely high in prebiotics. So a nice one to add in every now and then, artichoke, asparagus, brilliant, even onions, um, and so on, there's lots more. Um, so yeah, two to three bowel movements a day is ideal. Uh, majority of clients I personally see Generally, one bowel movement is probably the most common um, that people will say, and they generally, less bowel movements will have more hormone problems as well. So definitely getting more of a sober in, lots of vegetables, um, oats as well, as in the picture. Um, good to get these bowel movements going through. So blood sugar levels. Um, of course, this is going to help to improve insulin sensitivity. I would, this is important to recommend for almost everyone anyway for general health, but in terms of hormones, you don't want to be having that blood sugar roller coaster, the, um, the insulin reduced sensitivity. Um, so I would say ideally cut out refined carbohydrates, the sugary foods, include protein with each meal. So I mean, this is all standard healthy advice that we probably all give all the time. Um, but in terms of balancing hormones it is quite important so foods in their natural form rather than juices people will often have fruit juice believing they're being very healthy but of course the sugars the high rush of sugars is not particularly good for hormones um, and of course it's going to help to reduce weight get people to healthy bmi that's going to help to regulate the hormones as well so get the testosterone up for the men um, and also testosterone down for the women who have pcos so it does regulate those now, for inflammation, we need to consider the omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, um, lots of other omega-3 rich foods, the grass-fed meats as opposed to the farmed kind of grain-fed meats, there's nuts and seeds as well. And of course, this is going to impact hormone production as well. The amount of fats in the diet are obviously required for building the hormones as well as protein. Um, but making sure that people have lots of good fats or inflammation is particularly important for those conditions um, such as the endometriosis and other kind of pain symptoms. With period pains, this is probably some of the best feedback I've had in terms of if you can get the inflammation balance in the body, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, you can often completely eliminate period pains. Most people with period pains will have very, very high inflammatory levels, very high omega-6 intake, um, lots of vegetable oils and meats, for example, and low fish intake. And that's very, very common. Um, and it's also been shown in infertile men. They often have very, very low omega-3 levels associated with lots of inflammation as well. So making sure you can balance inflammation is, is key for a lot of, lot of the areas. And omega-3 EPA supplements. So, of course, if someone's not getting it from their diet, if they're not having lots of oily fish, uh, I mean, ideally you want around two portions of oily fish a week. Most people won't be getting this at all. They have maybe their fish and chips, their, um, their deep fried white fish is not exactly going to get their EPA levels up. But if someone has an inflammatory condition, EPA supplements are a sure way of getting a high dose in, controlling the inflammation, getting it down quite quickly. So these are two products at Igenis that I would highly recommend for balancing hormones. Um, now the Farm Epa Restore, you may, for anyone who's um, watched previous, previous webinars, you may notice a slight difference in the design of the packaging on the front and there's um, a slight difference as well in the ingredients they maintain. So I'll just go through these just so you're aware um, of, the, of the little changes. So in terms of inflammatory conditions, if someone has pain, if they have um, PCOS, for example, if there's lots of inflammation in the body, I would go straight away with Fumipa Restore. If anyone has acne, other symptoms, um, psoriasis, joint problems, if you can see they have inflammation, definitely go for Fumipa Restore, which has 1,000 milligrams of EPA. So this is an EPA-only supplement, which means that it's the most effective in terms of reducing inflammation in the body. Now, of course, DHA is a brilliant fat to have if you're fairly healthy, if your inflammation levels are quite good, but if your inflammation is quite high, your turnover of EPA is going to be very, very high, so you're going to need quite a bit more. So I would say two capsules of Farmy Pro Restore would be perfect for anyone with any kind of inflammation in the body. 
Now, farming for maintain is ideal for anyone with hormone imbalances, especially um, the progest low progesterone for women, as there's a little bit of evening primrose oil in the supplement. So restore is just the EPA derived from wild anchovies. Maintain is a combination of the EPA from wild anchovies with DHA and then also evening primrose oil as well. So you get a nice balance of EPA, you have 750 milligrams in maintain with 250 milligrams DHA. So of course, it's nice having both the fats in there um, for maintenance, for, for general well-being if someone has controlled inflammation. And then the GLA, 60 milligrams, a really good amount um, of evening primrose oil to have in there. So that's from over 700 milligrams of evening primrose oil, um, just so you can see how much is in there. So it's a really, really good dose. And the balance, as it's still much higher in omega-3, means it's still, still anti-inflammatory, which is perfect. Um, and there's a bit of vitamin D in maintain, so a little bit more support long term. Good dose, um, 30 micrograms, absolutely plenty. Um, so in five micrograms of the RDA, you're getting lots in there. And then there's vitamin E. So vitamin E in both of the supplements, so a good antioxidant to protect them um, from going rancid. So perfect supplements for hormone balancing, but I would say go for maintain if someone's fairly healthy already, if they don't have any inflammatory conditions, um, and restore for anyone with, with infl inflammation. And in terms of the capsules, they're both fish gelatin, so that makes it much easier. Right, so specific nutrients to support hormone health. I realise I'm going a little bit over time. I hope you don't mind too much. There's a few more slides, not too many. Um, so specific nutrients to support hormone health. We have vitamin B6, magnesium, zinc, vitamin E, vitamin C and vitamin D. Now, these are just a few. There's quite a lot. Um, someone was saying, could I elaborate on why DHA not good with inflammatory conditions? Um, so basically, DHA is predominantly a structural fat, so it takes up quite a lot of space in the cell membranes. If someone's supplementing DHA alongside EPA, EPA basically can't do its job quite as well as DHA is taking up the space. So in terms of if someone has lots of inflammation, it's really the ratio between EPA and arachidonic acid that's going to determine how much inflammation is going on in the body. So EPA is a functional fat. It's going to be turning over very, very high in the body. It's going to be used up a lot in inflammatory processes. DHA, as it's structural, basically sits there in the cell membrane. It's not quite as fun functional. So if you have lots of inflammation, your body is going to be using up lots and lots of EPA, um, but not so much the DHA. So there's lots of studies looking at how effective fish oils are in different ratios, DHA on its own, EPA on its own, combined. And it's been shown that the more EPA there is, or EPA on its own, is the most effective in terms of reducing inflammation. So that's why we have the EPA only product for anyone with inflammatory conditions. Um, someone's saying, why would you recommend the maintain to low progesterone? Um, the evening primrose oil helps to increase hormone production slightly. So it does help to increase production of progesterone. So if someone has low progesterone production, evening primrose oil has shown to help modulate this slightly. So it's a, I mean, it's generally quite a well-known supplement, I guess, having evening primrose oil hormone balancing, um, and that's usually why it helps to balance out progesterone, also estrogen to a certain extent. So back to the specific nutrients, we have lots of vitamins and minerals here. These are just a few of them really. Um, which are particularly important for production of certain hormones. But there, of course, are many, many others. Um, so generally speaking, I would concentrate on foods rich in these vitamins and minerals, but maybe recommend vitamin as well. So back to the supplements, all the different types of supplements. I'm talking a bit about evening primrose oil again. Um, also borage oil, they both contain GLA. Uh, evening primrose oil is a particularly nice source. It has all the, the tritopines, the nice antioxidants, um, which is a nice bonus having that as well. So really, you need to consider the omega-6 to omega-3 balance in the diet um, because they have such an impact on inflammation levels. So very, very high omega-6 diet is going to cause more inflammation. Uh, and evening primrose oil is an omega-6 fat, so it's an omega-6 GLA. Now, if someone 
um, submit and they want to find something for hormone balancing, they will usually themselves find evening primrose oil. So you may have clients come to see you that are taking huge doses of prim evening primrose oil on its own. And that's usually because, yes, it's an amazing supplement for balancing hormones. But if you're taking GLA on its own, you're going to be increasing your omega-6. And over time, can cause a massive increase in omega-6 and imbalance from omega-6 to omega-3. And that can cause too much inflammation. Uh, can even lead to an estrogen dominance as well. Um, so, I mean, it can it can lead to all sorts of problems. But generally speaking, it's the, it's the inflammation that's causing the issues. So anyone who's taking lots of evening primrose oil, great supplement to have. But I would say just make sure you're balancing it with lots of omega-3 as well. If someone's taking evening primrose oil, they could take Farmipa Restore um, alongside what they're already taking. Or they could just take Farmipa Maintain on its own. It's all about the arachidonic acid to EPA ratio. Um, so, yeah, so fish oils definitely want to go in there with EPA if someone has inflammation. Um, probiotics as well is another good one if you're trying to support digestive health. I mean, there's lots of others. There's, um, there's also digestive enzymes and all sorts in terms of digestion, obviously, but probiotics in particular to help um, get the hormones through. Um, nutrients, I'd often recommend multivitamin if someone's diet's not particularly good. Uh, and then there's herbal supplements as well, um, particularly cherry concentrates. So you can have like the cherry juice, which is brilliant for increasing melatonin levels. So if someone's having difficulty sleeping, that's always a nice one to have as well. So exercise. Um, of course, exercise is very important for hormone production and the balance as well it helps to increase insulin sensitivity um, it helps to regulate testosterone production as well so increasing it for men so very very important for men with low testosterone intensity on exercise really depends on the individual and it depends on their hormone issues as well uh, if someone has pcos for example it's going to be very difficult for them to um to reduce their symptoms but i would recommend that they do quite a bit of exercise mostly weight training um, as well so resistance training in particular does increase testosterone in both men and women um, but again with PCOS um, generally exercise will reduce their testosterone so it is quite different in in different types of people uh, cardio training always good to have a small amount of cardio training unless someone's adrenally fatigued then of course you don't want to be having too much um, cardio training uh, and then there's relaxation exercises, which of course everyone can always do a little bit more relaxation. So yoga, um, swimming, anything that's going to be a, a little bit easier. So stress levels, always easy to tell someone to reduce their stress, but it's not exactly um, practical. So giving people practical relaxation techniques is always going to help in terms of bringing people's um, stress hormones down, especially cortisol. So someone may be interested in learning about meditation, yoga, or even the simplest things, having a bath in the evening, spending certain time reading in the evening, something they enjoy, basically putting aside time to relax. Um, so in terms of when you see clients and they say they're really, really stressed, they can't sleep, for example, so every night, spend half an hour, time to yourself, relaxing, reading a magazine, whatever it is, um, something that they enjoy, time away from work, time to kind of relax the brain um, and in terms of hobbies always good to pick up new hobbies to help to distract the mind from other kind of stresses if someone's stressed about work other kind of uh, financial pressures whatever it is it's good to have different hobbies to be able to do something completely different um, which otherwise may, may be stressing them out There's too many people that work very 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 hard until late in the evening and then suddenly try to fall asleep and it's of course very difficult so Lots of different ways to target stress. Um, it's just a few of them. Sleep quality. So important for hormone balancing is the quality of sleep. So, of course, we need recovery. We need rest, especially if someone's doing lots of exercise as well. And in terms of being able to fall asleep, always ensure that your clients are in a dark room to start with. So, of course, melatonin levels are going to increase in the if someone has a laptop screen in their face late at night, um, it may affect their melatonin levels. So it may, may be quite low. Ideally, you want a very quiet environment so someone can fully relax. So lots, not lots of electronic devices, flashing lights, 
um, and making noises as well. So very, very quiet. Another practical tip is to tell people to have all their to-do lists done. So a lot of people can't sleep because they're worried about too many things. They have to do the next morning. They suddenly remember something else. I always say write everything down the night before you go to sleep so that you have your plan for the next day. It really, really helps in just being able to switch off and not having to worry about anything. Um, and also, of course, not working too close to bedtime. And back to melatonin levels. Uh, to get these levels, you ideally want them to be quite low in the day and then go up before bedtime to help you feel sleepy. And sunlight is going to reduce these levels. So if someone can be exposed to sunlight outside, so looking at the sunlight, so not with um, big hat and sunglasses, getting some exposure to the eyes uh, will really help to regulate melatonin. And then later on when they rise, it's much more likely someone's going to be able to sleep. Um, someone's just saying they've lost the sound. Is it, can anyone else hear me? Yep. I think it's very different for different people, but a couple of you got cut off there. Um, so herbal supplements. Now, I'm not a herbalist, so this is not really my area of expertise. But there are a lot of people that take herbal supplements for their estrogenic activity. So black cohosh is a, is a very well-known one in terms of, especially if a woman's going through menopause. Um, quite good anecdotal evidence in terms of reducing hot flushes, for example. Um, and there's lots of other herbs as well. St. John's wort, ashwagandha, maca root, um, suma. There is, however... I, I try to look into the research and there's a lot of inconclusive evidence for herbal supplements. I think this is generally always the case. There's just not enough big trials um, on these herbs. Of course, people don't want to put the money into something that's completely natural. It's not beneficial for people. So I think they, they may have some beneficial effect, but there's just really not much scientific evidence to support any herbs in particular. But I would say black cohosh is possibly one of the best in terms of anecdotal evidence out there. Um, so placebo controlled trials generally don't show significant benefits um, on hormone balancing or menopausal causal symptoms. But there are a lot of people out there who will say they're absolutely amazing. So I would say worth trying if someone really wants to go completely natural and they're really getting a lot of symptoms, I would say a good one to go for. So this is just a summary, all the different points I've spoken about in terms of the nutritional protocol, which I would flow for any single person with any kind of hormone imbalance, whether you've tested or not. Um, this is a good one to follow. So there's about um, 12 different pair. So first of all, most importantly, is to identify the hormone imbalances. So find out what's going wrong, and this is through analysing symptoms. So if you can analyse the symptoms and link this to certain hormone imbalances, this is going to be quite useful initially um, and if a client's willing to do a diagnostic test of course that's absolutely brilliant especially the saliva testing for women um, very very useful to be able to understand what's going on at different times throughout the month so next after you've identified what's going on in terms of the imbalanced hormones I would recommend as the most important thing to reduce toxin exposure so this can be from the diet the environment heavy metals as well so all the kind of products that contain lots of these chemicals and and then foods as well so having organic foods of course is going to be ideal but most importantly getting rid of all those chemicals in cleaning products and beauty products etc um so live, liver support um consider alcohol consumption consider the cruciferous vegetables the fiber everything that's going to help generally over the long term constantly support the liver and, and then, of course, digestive health, which links in very nicely with the liver, getting healing a leaky gut if, if that is the problem, getting lots of nice probiotics in there, ensure there's lots of fibre as well, so getting at least a couple of bowel movements per day, um, and then the blood sugar balance. So balancing blood sugar is going to help to improve insulin sensitivity, and, of course, that's going to be great for other kind of hormone balances as well. So a few other points which I've gone through, but just to... To summarise, fat intake, make sure someone's including lots of the polyunsaturated fats, nuts and seeds and fish in their diet, and of course control the inflammation. So for any kind of conditions linked to inflammation, PCOS, endometriosis, acne, you can have huge improvements with controlling the inflammation, um, both addressing the root cause and also the symptoms as well. So it really, really helps with pain reduction for any kind of inflammatory conditions. Um, so 
Next point, nutrient-rich diet. So of course, the more nutrients, the more equipped the body is at supporting the production of these hormones. So some clients may require additional supplementation if they can't quite get it from their diet. Um, so someone's just asking questions, is it possible to send the slides by email? Yes, you'll all get the slides sent by email as well. Um, so the slide chemicals to avoid in food, mercury, arsenic, lead, cadmium. I know you've covered some of these, which other chemicals and foods or others should we all avoid? Um, most of the chemicals in food come from pesticides. So there's quite a few. I'm not sure of all the exact names of all the pesticides out there. There's so many. Um, but generally speaking, it's heavy metals in large fish or pesticides in other kind of foods. That's the main source of chemicals um, that you'll be finding in food. So back to the summary. So after you've made sure that someone has quite a nutrient-rich diet, um, then consider all their lifestyle options. So you've got the exercise targeting stress levels, lots of relaxation, um, recommendations for improving sleep quality, which I've gone through, and then possible herbal supplements for someone if they feel these may help to ease their symptoms if they really want to make sure they have something else. Um, so here's all the references I've used um, for this talk. And here are my contact details. So if any of you want to contact me, send me an email and ask any other questions, um, if they're quite specific, then that's absolutely free to email me. Otherwise, if anyone has any other small questions now, please feel free to ask in the little chat box on the bottom left-hand corner. You can see some people typing away. Just waiting for a few questions to come through. Um, so someone's saying, I drink lots of mineral water from plastic bottles. Should I use glass bottles? Yes, I would recommend using glass bottles um, over having plastic bottles. Almost all plastic bottles will have chemicals which will leach into the water to a certain extent, um, especially if they've been stored for a long time in these bottles. So, yeah, glass over plastic, definitely. Um, so does chicory leaf have prebiotic properties or is it just the root? Um, I'm pretty sure it's the whole plant, actually, so um, the, the leaf as well. There's like a, a cabbage, a long cabbage type vegetable, and it's, it's that part that has the high prebiotic content, but it's 20-fold it's almost all other um, vegetables which have prebiotic content, so it's a really, really high concentration. Which of your wonderful cake recipes do you recommend for balancing hormones? Um, I guess you're talking about my Healthy Bake website, which I post lots of um, healthy cake recipes. Anyone, any with lots of um, lots of good fats in there, so any with coconut oil, um, any with seeds as well, and also with fibre. So any with whole grains using lots of oats in there is a good one. So lots of the muffins with oats is always is always a nice way to get lots of cakes in in a healthy way to balance hormones. <laughs> Interesting question. Um, do you know whether rosacea is linked to hormonal imbalance and can omega-3 su supplementation, supplementation be helpful? Um, rosacea is usually linked to inflammation, so not necessarily so much to do with hormone imbalances, um, maybe to a certain extent, but generally speaking there's a lot of inflammation going on. So omega-3 EPA only is very, very efficient for reducing rosacea. So I would say um, whatever the cause, if someone has rosacea, they've got lots of redness, EPA, I would recommend Farmipa Restore, brilliant for reducing inflammation very quickly. Uh, within around two, three months, you see quite big improvements. Um, someone else is saying I use filter bottles. Yeah, generally speaking, I would say best to, to filter water. All right, I think most of you have asked all the questions, so um, thank you all for listening. Um, there's quite a lot to say on hormone health, of course. It's a very complex topic, but I hope I've given you some of the practical tips on what to do and the breakdown of the nutritional protocol of what I would recommend. Thank you all, too, for listening. Yes, someone's saying rosacea linked to hydrochloric acid. If, yeah, digestion, definitely a link there as well. 
um, how to get the slides. They'll all be emailed to you as you've all signed up to this. Um, so within the next couple of days, they should be automatically sent to you. All right. Thank you, everybody. And I will speak to you soon. Thanks. Bye.